we're going to change gears a little bit and we're, we're going to try to bring this back home to Minnesota. Uh, we started with Minnesota, we looked at the U.S. history and we want to come back to our Minnesota experience. I'm going to ask uh, three good friends and colleagues to, to join us up front here. You can bring your name tags along if you'd like. Uh, and I think we'll ask them to speak uh, from the table. Um, it's interesting as I reflected on listening to our team uh, talk about the U.S. history, um, a lot of these issues have very deep, long threads. Um, the, the National Consumer League was founded in 1899, concerns about consumers and, and sweatshops, uh, the labor movement, yeah, the women's movement goes way, way back. So uh, we've been interested in how this has unfolded and Archie's point about how it really came to a boiling point with four of those movements in the 60s was, was a fascinating one. Um, a couple of the questions that were raised, I think, are going to be addressed by this panel. We've got three folks. Uh, they're, as I said, their bios are in, in your program, but Nate Garvis was longtime uh, VP Government Affairs at Target, so he has a great sense of the Target experience. But he's also been doing some really interesting work uh, that's innovative uh, as he has moved into the next phase of his career. He is the founder of something called Naked Civics. And uh, aside from the... Uh, <coughs> stimulating name for that organization. It, it really works on social relevance and social initiatives of business and civic initiatives. Uh, Mary Picard uh, has uh, deep roots, if I can say that, Mary, with uh, the St. Paul companies and, and later travelers, and she's now uh, a, an advisor, principal advisor with Ald Adler Philanthropy Group, which is family foundations and a corporation. And David Etzweiler, uh, uh, was the head of the foundation and community affairs at Medtronic, uh, and he's now working on a, a partnership between the Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota called the Decade of Discovery, uh, looking for a cure for treatment and cure of uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, I think each of them has a perspective in how Minnesota has evolved in this question of corporate responsibility, and each of them has ways of, of uh, raising issues and looking ahead that I think uh, you'll find interesting. Um, and with respect to that one question back here, David uh, chaired a, a task force for the Council on Foundations that talked about um, increasing, enhancing impact, increasing value, which gets at that question of uh, bringing the foundation and the giving together with the, the, with the business. Um, we have a number of, uh, we have an opportunity to hear from Nate, but he has to leave at five. Uh, so I'm going to ask him to lead off and then give you an opportunity to ask Nate a few questions. Um, he has other responsibilities uh, <laughs> that he has Only to, child to meet up to. Um, <laughs> and I'll ask Nate to, to begin with some remarks and uh, then we'll ask some questions. Well, uh, thanks for this opportunity and thanks for the phenomenal book. I've been uh, paging through it and uh, I'm very, very excited about delving into it. And I appreciate this opportunity to speak from the perspective of a practitioner uh, and as a Minnesota-based, uh, Minnesota-centric, I'll call it that, a Minnesota-centric uh, practitioner. You know, the old saw is that uh, those that don't study history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, my background is in history and I study history so I can repeat the best parts of it. <laughs> um, I am a child of this state. I have moved away unsuccessfully three times and uh, keep on coming back for the same reason. Uh, the civic culture here is powerful and it is ubiquitous. It spans well beyond the corporate community. It's in every sector. In fact, uh, I'm gonna start my remarks with a, a story that was told, actually a comment that was told to me the first week that I went to work for Dayton Hudson, not Target. 1993, I was hired by their uh, legendary general counsel, uh, Jim Hale. Uh, Jim sat me down and he said, uh, you are gonna be at the steering wheel of a $13 billion corporation. It's 67 now, but back then it was 13. And he said, there's a lot you can do with $13 billion and there's a lot that you can screw up with $13 billion. You can try and fall asleep at night knowing that you didn't do the right thing out there or you can fall asleep well rested and know that you did right by your community. And he looked me square in the eye and he said, I want you coming well rested every day. And that really was my permission slip to focus 
on the community to help Dayton Hudson and then Target to be as relevant as possible to a very fast changing community around us. I guess I was a puppy who liked to be trained through treats rather than uh, <laughs> newspapers. But, and, the, and, and I can't claim credit to that. That was the history, the tradition, the culture that I had joined. And it was powerful and it was articulated well. Um, and what, the way I articulated it for myself was, and it really does go to that 5% uh, um, ethic that is you know, pretty wide in, in our corporate community here, and it's basically that no one does well in a bad community. No one does well. Unless you run drugs or guns, no one does well in a bad community. And back then, you know, we were department stores as well as a discounter, and um, our customers didn't live in bad neighborhoods. Our employees weren't coming out of bad neighborhoods. We needed to be in good neighborhoods. What we really needed to be in was well-regulated neighborhoods. Except regulation has to, in our mind, in my mind certainly, had to be more than just what was legally permissible. Regulation actually is how every sector in a community behaves, not just the corporate sector, not just uh, the rest of the business sector. Uh, it's how is the government acting? How are the academic institutions performing? How are the nonprofits, arts organizations, uh, faith based institutions? All of those institutional forms are powerful. Not powerfully good, not powerfully bad, they're just powerful. They become powerfully good when we put intention behind them. And that was really our ethic. How do we put intentionally good power behind how we were going to regulate our communities? Not just be regulated, but actually to be a regulating force. And I think one of the ways best to describe that is to actually share with you uh, one of many, 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 many stories I could go through, but one, um, having to do with pseudoephedrine sales. Um, we had a lot of great uh, relationships in the law enforcement community. I got called once by the Commissioner of Public Safety who said that Target was an unwitting abetter and a horrible felony. And I said to my friend Man Michael Campion, I'm too fat to wear stripes unless they're pinstripes, so uh, <laughs> tell me what's going on. And he said, folks, we're stealing pseudoephedrine products off of your shelves, and they were cooking it into methamphetamine. Do you know about methamphetamine? I said, yes, I do. I actually had lived out in Oregon and studied that issue. There aren't many ex-meth addicts, and they are super fun sites. Uh, we're ready to blow, right? And I said, okay, let us go to work on that. That's not good for our communities. And we went to work, and uh, Target's now CEO, which was then our president, Greg Steinhoffel, uh, uh, sat down with a team and I'll tell you it's not a very popular day when you go in and say I want to change the vending practices of 350 million dollars of your product oh and by the way I want to inconvenience mothers and their sniffly toddlers <laughs> but to Greg's uh, credit Greg didn't take more than 30 seconds to say we're going to do something about this and what we did is we ended up moving all of that product voluntarily behind the counter inconveniencing mothers and their sniffly uh, toddlers. And we told them why we were doing it. We said, we're sorry for the inconvenience, but this is about something more important to you. We were clear in articulating what that was. The reason why I mention that story is that there is a law in the land, in every jurisdiction in our country, that requires what Target did. We pre-regulated ourselves and did so in a way that not only reduced the frictional costs of having to fight legislation, so that's a self-interest, but we used the opportunity to build and deepen relationships with our customer base. That's our self-interest as well. In fact, I think that the way corporate social responsibility works best is when you do play to a corporation's self-interest. But that's where the marketplace comes in. Yes, we can talk about political af uh, uh, antagonism out there, and that's not that that's going to go away, but increasingly we are faced with an environment where the opportunities have never been greater for the community at large to say, if you do it this way, I can reward you. I can reward you not only by servicing your business, I can reward you by passing on a good word. That's a huge part of compensation right now. I believe that not only was that a good history lesson for me at Target, it was a great formative way of building my practice. It's why I went off to create a practice that was focused on civic outcome rather than political input. 
But I believe that it's actually very prescient for the way that the world is turning out right now. There is a problem with only relying on laws. First is that laws are made in capitals full of professionally pissed off people right now. It's really hard to pass a good law. It is. But there's something bigger going on too. And, and uh, I loved Ken Powell's stories uh, earlier in the day because the fact of the matter is, is that we have globalized. And it's not just that corporations, multinational national corporations are some of the wealthiest institutional forms on the planet right now. It's that laws are functions of physical political borders. There's only so much a law can do right now. We can regulate air quality all you want in LA and you will still be bur uh, uh, breathing soft coal that was burned in, in China. There's no law for that. That's not to say that we don't want a an unregulated environment. We all need a regulated environment. It's really about where does that conversation happen and how does it occur? And does it occur just strictly in an adversarial set setting? Or do we also allow for deeper, more meaningful conversations that are much more interested in an outcome than the political inputs? We can argue about cap and trade legislation all we want. But the more products and services that we're allowed to buy that have environmental stewardship designed right in, the better the planet is and someone's making money doing it, which is good too. So I look at corporate social responsibility. The future of it really is about corporate social relevance. How do corporations use that issue to differentiate themselves in the marketplace, to say everything that is is a commodity, but what we mean is different. And the best way to show you that I mean something more important to you is to actually get to your civic heart. What improves your world? And if I can show you that I am paying attention to the same things, just like Ken did today. I'm paying attention to the palm oil issue and we have things to learn, then our job as consumers is to buy a box of Cheerios to reward that behavior rather than just always punishing. The, the marketplace of the public square has never been more robust and um, these are complex conversations that happen within these very complex uh, organisms called corporations. It's one of the reasons why I asked Ken the question earlier. There is the top-down organization of a corporation and increasingly there is the culture within the corporation that is hardly top-down. And that's the conversation that we can tap into. Social entrepreneurship, in my mind, is the new public policy right now. Politics is not pushing us forward. It's pushing us left. It's pushing us right. Corporations need to be part of what puts us forward, but they're not there to do it by themselves. They're no more out there to do it by themselves than we should say that government should be doing this by itself, or that the church should be doing it by itself, or that a school should be doing it by itself. That's the lesson I learned at, at Dayton Hudson, is that no one does well in a bad community, and that community is a plural, not an individual. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Really uh, refreshing perspective. Thanks. I just wonder how you see um, B corporations fitting into the idea of civic outcomes, or are they just irrelevant? I, I love them. Um, it's uh, who knows if it will work, but I love the fact that there is an organized community that wants to express themselves as businesses, but to, to differentiate themselves within that construct as well, to say, yes, we're businesses, and yes, we need to derive a product, but our value proposition is really a values proposition. And I like, the, I like it because it's a roadmap to the public. It allows us to pick and choose who we want to support. And m this is coming from a guy who worked for a retailer for a long time. The market, you really do, prosper when you listen to the marketplace. So if you can give those roadmaps to the marketplace, our job is to reward them. I think the B Corp label is a, a nice little innovation to say, hey, pay attention to me. I'm different than the next guy. Gary Nunn, Nate, if you can stay with us for a while. Sure, absolutely. All right. I guess uh, I... I 
when, when David and I talked about this, um, we were talking about the meaning of corporate responsibility. And I, and I said, well, I do think it's broader than community affairs. He said, well, that's pretty amazing because you spent your whole career in community affairs, so maybe you should talk about that. And, um, and I, now, because of the little bit of conversation we had about community affairs, I, I kind of want to talk about that. So I'll touch on, um, on both, but I want to go back to um, uh, what Archie talked about in the 60s and 70s a little bit first. Um, I joined the St. Paul Companies in 1972, and um, it, there was a lot going on at that time, and a fellow by the name of Ron Hubbs, who was then the chairman of St. Paul Companies, uh, who we called the Renaissance Man because he was a member of the Civil War Roundtable. He collected rare books and orchids, and, um, and he wrote for science journals about earthquakes because he had worked in Northern California for a property liability company, which was the St. Paul Companies, and the, at that time the St. Paul Fire and Marine. And they, uh, he worried a lot about earthquakes, and so he decided to learn about them and, and ended up writing about them. So this was a man that had a, quite a mind and um, certainly a liberal arts mind, you might say, uh, which was um, important at the time, I think, for what it was that he did, which is, um, which is that he decided, um, before I got there in 1972, he decided um, that corporate responsibility was important, and he in fact defined it as the stakeholder um, uh, uh, definition, customers, employees, communities, suppliers, government, um, and, uh, and shareholders as a, <laughs> yes, not, not as a second thought though, I don't think. Um, and, uh, and talked about the need to balance obligations to those groups, and uh, created a department that was, he brought a fellow, uh, an HR guy that he had worked with in Northern California to head up this new thing called Human Relations Department, which was to, um, which was to uh, put some shape to that, uh, some kind of a system to it, and to begin to define what it meant and to think about how to move the corporation into this direction. And so he started formalizing the Community Affairs Program, which is how I got uh, into it. Um, but in addition to that, he was looking at issues like ethics statements and privacy statements, uh, definitely ahead of the curve on those, um, and uh, ended up authoring um, both of those um, for the company. Um, and, and looked at it from the standpoint of not so much um, how much money are we giving in the community, that was important, but how are we behaving in the community <clears throat> and what opportunities are we creating through our products and services. Um, so that's when there was quite a bit of work, for example, for an insurance company to ensure that minority contractors got bonds um, and they were able to do their business. So getting involved in the community developing uh, collegial and friendly relations with people in the community so that more of those things could happen. And in those days, things were pretty separate. Um, they were pretty, I, people were mostly isolated in their, their own uh, sort of categories of people. Um, and I think at that time, I noticed some of, uh, you know, this notion of stories and what kinds of stories do you tell? Um, there were quite a few stories that were being told at that time about the company's um, beginnings and, and continued to be told of um, during the, after the, was it the Chicago fire, Karen? <laughs> Thank you. After the Chicago fire paying off all claims when some companies were only giving a percentage. Um, and so these stories would be told over and over and over again in the organization and people said, well, that's who we are, that's our culture, that's who we are, so that's the way we're gonna behave. And I think that there was for a long time this sense, I think, bolstered by the notion of what the insurance industry was in, in the sense that um, you, could, you didn't want an insurance company you couldn't trust. So trust and the ability to be trustworthy and earning trust was extremely important culturally for the organization, just from a business perspective, but I think it shaped very much the way in which the company approached its world. And so 
Um, having come out of the 60s and a child of the 60s, um, I said there were two kinds of organizations I would, and I was a journalism major, uh, there were two kinds of companies I would never work for. One was a bank and the other was an insurance company. <laughs> Mostly because there were rows and rows of women at typewriters and I said, uh, you know, that wasn't for me. And so, um, so I was pleasantly surprised by what I found and, um, and I think that part of what I saw there at the time that was talked about today by Ken was um, a curiosity and an openness to debate. There, there was a lot of debate. Um, and I remember when the, we had a medical malpractice crisis and we had a fellow in our senior uh, ranks who had worked in government and was very, very uh, capable in, in the public arena. And he was working with our insurance uh, group to try to figure out how to solve the medical malpractice crisis. And a lot, a lot of other companies were pulling out of the business and doctors were gonna be without insurance. And um, I used to come in, I was young, I'd come in on the weekend and work all the time. And they were, we didn't have any offices, so they were over in the corner and they were yelling at each other and screaming and talking and week after week after week. And finally they came out with a solution, uh, a product, a new product. Um, and it changed the industry at the time for that product and made it available and financially feasible for physicians to have medical malpractice insurance. I will never forget that. I just thought, now these guys are really heroes. They, they just worked on this until they could figure it out. And I, I always, they could have easily backed away from it because it wasn't necessarily the most profitable kind of business in the world. So I think that some of these stories, these kind of characters, this ability, this culture, this ability to have conversations, and as a young person, I was allowed to disagree and be sort of an upstart, and it was okay, and people would listen and um, take what I had into consideration, but I always knew somebody else was gonna make the decision and it might not go my way. Um, so, as I think about the future of corporations and, um, and corporate responsibility, I see some kind of key conflicts that I think are important to think about that I've seen over the years. One is the conflict of do you listen and engage, like Nate said, or do you lock yourself up with people like you and stay, stick to your position? I think that's a really critical difference in the way some organizations work. Um, I think that increasingly people hunger for meaning in their lives. This is, I know this is something everybody seems to say, I don't have any data to prove it, but it seems to me that's true. And that when employees are honestly engaged in something bigger than themselves that means something to them, they're just an, a force to be reckoned with. And I think it's really powerful in organizations. And I think to the extent corporations can harness that and, um, and think about what what the purpose is of a company, as you had talked about, Jim, that uh, that can really make a difference. Um, another is the art of short-term versus long-term, um, dealing with the shareholder interests and the need to produce results short-term and the patience to be able to hang on long-term and the systems in place to be able to figure out how to make that happen, um, I think is critical. Um, management used to be, um, taking the fuzzy edges off of everything and making everything really clear. And that was always the pressure. Make it clear, make it short, make it quick, get it done. As opposed to let's think about this in the bigger picture and strategize. Um, and I think there's more strategizing now. Um, and then I think, I think the other is that um, the education of, of people and the values um, that people have I work now in a family foundation. I work with young young people in the family, and they're very different in the way they do their philanthropy and in the way they think about their work. And I think that looking at that generational difference will help to think about how it is that business is gonna change, because I think um, we have more and more young people, thanks to teachers who taught, I think, about volunteerism and community work and issues in schools, we, I think we have a lot more young people who are thinking about how it is that they can make the world a better place and want to do that in their jobs. 
So I'll end there. And then we can talk about community affairs maybe later. Yeah. Great. So let me um, echo the remarks about the afternoon. It's been great to, to hear the overview of the book. And um, I, I am actually uh, incented to crack the binder and move into it this weekend. So it's been a, a great conversation. And thanks to the, to the center for hosting the event. Uh, David asked me to do a couple of things, um, which um, are, uh, are not big asks, but they are big asks in the standpoint that he asked me to do that in eight to 10 minutes. And the two things that he asked me to do was to bring home the story or the conversation uh, that we heard earlier today and really apply it to, to the Minnesota story through the Medtronic lens. Um, and from there, asked me to go back out to more of a national or a global basis um, and extend some of that conversation to um, our understandings that we brought forward uh, through the task force on the future of corporate philanthropy uh, that I co-chaired. Um, at the Council on Foundations and some of the conversations um, about um, why do we do this? Should it be close to the business? Should it be separated? I think we'll really be drawn uh, out of that conversation. I hope it will be um, because it's a, it's a good tension, I think, to have in the room. And I think it's a good tension to have in a corporation to be really candid. Um, so let me, um, in order to make the, the best use of the time here, let me kind of state my bias up front or my premise uh, up front a little bit. And I will uh, readily acknowledge that um, the, the wording on the page here has been tempered by the, the uh, size of the book and the speakers here today because um, my, my original thought for all of you was that corporate responsibility is in the midst of, and I had in my notes a fairly audacious statement, the, the, the most dramatic shift, right? Until I started listening to people and then I crossed it out and I said, one of the more. And now, now I realize, especially with these four scholars in front of me, that I, I will simply say a very dramatic shift uh, in terms of its evolution in history. And I don't think it takes a lot of convincing for people in the room to understand that many of the forces that, are, that have been referenced today that are at place really are shaping that very dramatically. Globalization has come up a couple of times uh, today. The growing complexity of the issues uh, that we're dealing with, uh, Nate just brought that up again. Uh, Ken talked about uh, the difficulty, uh, you know, that I think U.S. Uh, corporations in particular are finding in moving into emerging markets. It certainly has been the experience that I've had um, in, in um, the corporate setting. But the decline in the resources and the influence of government, um, the increase in power uh, of the corporation, uh, Chris Penny, uh, Judy's uh, colleague from the Aspen Institute, uh, who helped us author the report um, that I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, is uh, always quick to say that if corporations were economies, 100 of the top 200 would be corporations. And every time he says that, I pause and I think about what that means um, to, to us. Um, and so the, the list really goes on from there. But I need to say that the, for me, the bias and the premise here is that as powerful as those drivers of change are, that the most powerful change that I have seen has been in the recognition of the shared value concept or value creation of bringing all of these assets that are so hard to define in the corporate setting together and understanding that there are ways to bring together societal advantage with corporate advantage um, that are very powerful both for both of those. And I share that bias and I share the fear of uh, most of you in the room, I would guess, of, of understanding that that can go very well and that can go uh, quite far awry. And in fact, that really was the, the, the reason that the task force on the future of corporate philanthropy came forward. This bias of that group of understanding and believing that if we do this correctly, that so many can, can uh, be well served. Uh, but if we don't do that correctly, we don't manage it, we don't professionalize the field, we don't talk about what the operating system looks like, we're not explicit about what role the foundation plays, for example, vis-a-vis -vis other parts of the corporation, uh, that we're really doomed to take a path going the other way for society. So that is really, um, that is really the bias that, that I bring to the, to the uh, microphone today. 
the the Medtronic story, I think, is probably the the uh, can be best told in three parts. And Medtronic uh, began in 1949, and really for almost the first 50 years, I think the um, the the corporate citizenship side of that was really, which was marked, by the way, by the sixth mission statement that Earl Bakken wrote to be a good corporate citizen. Uh, Earl's not going to win any awards for uh, poetic license. Um, on the other hand, for 50 years, it was really, really clear what that meant uh, to our communities. It meant being generous with a check. It meant responding to community needs. It meant uh, pairing with organizations. It meant employee engagement. And it was a phenomenal place for us uh, to be. It was very traditional uh, philanthropy. It was diffuse, and it absolutely matched uh, the requirements of the time and the opportunities of the time. In 1998, there was a fairly dramatic shift um, in what happened um, for the company. And at that time, um, we assembled a number of emerging leaders in the company. There was a sense from our executives and from others that while we were doing good work, that we were not getting the highest return on investment for our communities, and probably a growing sense that in terms of strategy, that there was a better way to do this too. And so we did a little bit of, of sleuthing. Um, uh, it, we actually had a full-blown strategy process with emerging leaders in the company. And we recognized the fact that within our fairly generous portfolio, and this was focused on the foundation, that only 11% of our grant making was done was being done in healthcare. And that's a really interesting fact um, from a company that is the largest medical device manufacturer in the world, right? 11% uh, of the grant making is, is being done in health. And there was a sense and an understanding that the passion and the knowledge and the networks and the resources of this company, let alone the products, really provided this opportunity to do so much more. And we asked ourselves, what was it about our model that was causing us to fund away from those strengths? And the answer uh, is, is part of the conversation that's happened in the room today, right? It didn't feel right. And, and for most of those 50 years, it wasn't right. It wasn't part of that dialogue. But as we sat with emerging leaders, um, we came to, to, to bring out that healthy tension of saying, yeah, but we have so much more to offer. And we can get such a greater return for, for the socioeconomically disadvantaged folks who are part of our mission statement in the foundation. Surely there must be a way for us to manage this um, in order to respect not only the legal and the ethical lines, but certainly the lines of, of just general appropriateness and, and practicality. And from that conversation, we launched into uh, what most in the room would call strategic philanthropy. And that philanthropy um, was marked by some flagship programs, including one called the Patient Link Program, which is a five and a half million dollar annual spend a year at last, uh, last time I looked at the budget. This is a program that funds patient associations that provide education, support, and advocacy to, pay, to uh, patients. Um, and this is a program that focused on healthcare disparities experienced um, by women, by Native Americans, by folks of color. This was clearly a societal issue. It was clearly a business issue for us. And the opportunity came for us to be very clear about what the foundation's role would be in that, in that um, uh, partnership, as well as the company. And importantly, it was defined not by the generosity of that program and the grants that were made. Importantly, it was defined by the relationships that we built the issues we defined together, and the goals and outcomes we achieved. So this was a program that worked very closely um, in putting on conferences um, for folks uh, in these patient associations, for example, in Washington, D.C., with the Black Women's Health Imperative on how to do outreach to African American communities, how to do outreach to, to Hispanic communities. Um, very important, fairly basic in some ways, uh, um, conversations that we had, but it was an opportunity to do those kinds of things. It was an opportunity to join with them to provide uh, awards to members of Congress and senators for their work uh, in health disparities. It was a true partnership. And that worked incredibly well. For, um, so well, in fact, that about eight years beyond that, just uh, four years ago, we um, 
we went to leadership, we went to our CEO, and we said, we think we found a way to protect the lines of appropriateness. We think the company is benefiting uh, generously from this. And we think that um, from a philanthropic standpoint and a corporate citizenship standpoint, that this is the path. We are starting to see leading corporations looking well beyond their foundation. Because you know what, we've got $33 million annual spend at the time in the foundation, $75 million in philanthropy in the company, but we are surrounded by billions of dollars of assets of our people around the world. And one of your most pressing uh, issues, actually your most pressing issue, is how do you serve emerging markets? And lo and behold, when it comes to non-communicable disease, heart disease and diabetes, that's where the rubber hits the road. We can do this differently. And so, long story uh, made uh, fairly short is that we asked to lead, and we did lead throughout the company, uh, a process that put our corporate citizenship and business um, strategies not just into alignment, but actually integrated the two. Um, and brought together um, our global policy folks, our product innovation folks, uh, and the, uh, the foundation folks with a strategy that we rolled out at the Clinton Glo Global Initiative through our CEO as a way of saying this is how, this is what we believe. We believe that shared value is the path forward. Um, we were very upfront about that. And um, that we believe that this is the best way to serve um, society and the company writ large, again, with very clear lines. So that's, that is a very quick run through the, the Medtronic story. The relationship to the task force on the future of philanthropy, which I should note, um, uh, Ellen Luger, who was uh, here earlier today, was part of that task force, uh, as well as was Jacob Gale from Medtronic. Uh, and Bill King, uh, who is in the room, was certainly uh, an advisor throughout the process and a partner on a number of the conversations that we had here in Minnesota. But that task force really came together because many of us in the field nationally were recognizing that this was coming forward, these shared value concepts. We were very excited about the kind of work that Ken shared with you earlier today uh, and proud of a lot of the work that was taking place, but we also knew that if we didn't have the conversation, if we didn't think about um, what our recommendations were for the field, that this could go in a direction that was um, diametrically opposed to what our goals were. And so that the results, um, um, the process was um, an 18 month process where we really engaged the entire field. We were um, on planes and doing focus groups and interviews around the country, uh, pressure testing what these themes are in terms of the future of corporate philanthropy. And, and the report, which I'll hold up in just a minute, certainly doesn't suggest that this is the majority view. It's not the majority view right now, at, at least in terms of where people are. But we do um, take a position, as does the council has taken a position to say, we believe in this when well managed. We believe this is the future. Um, the organization from a corporate standpoint has really geared itself around, um, uh, around that future. Um, but there are recommendations here about what we need to do as a field in order to make sure that we manage this um, for public good. So um, th this is the publication, by the way. It's Increasing Impact, Enhancing Value, and uh, we released it back in April. It's on the Council on Foundations website. It's actually very easy to find within the corporate section, and I do have some extra copies if folks are interested in it. Um, but I will, I, I'll leave it, leave it open from there. Thank you. David, thank you. I apologize. We're going to excuse, uh, we're going to excuse Nate uh, and thank him very much for being here today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'll give him a little book plug. I should mention that uh, he has a book coming out uh, and there's a reference to it in your, in your programs. I'll throw it open to questions. Doug and Bob both have uh, um, microphones. Um, we're going to ask uh, Bob to... Give it to Bob McGregor here for a second. <clears throat> Thank you uh, very much for your, your panelists. I guess my question could be answered by either panel. Um, I believe that uh, corporations sh should be regulated, Sarbanes-Oxley, Dodd-Frank, da-da-da-da. But that isn't enough. Uh, after all these regulations have passed, we still have major uh, problems and breakdowns. MF Global with John Corson, 100 or 1 billion, 600 million missing, Barclay Bank, and on and on and on. 
uh, we still have failure. And I go back uh, in my days, I worked for the, the old school business leaders. Ron Hubbs was, I, I remember him. And the CEOs, they're all flawed, but they had basic core values. And I think of uh, the, the Ken Dayton's, the Jim Renier, who headed our center, the CEO of Honeywell, Dave Coach, who set up the Good Pastors Chair, Elmer Anderson, Chuck Batty, the president of Sprint, Jim Bray, who was the chairman of Borg Warner, all had core religious uh, uh, values. And we often quote Ken Dayton, the purpose of business, to serve society. Profit is our reward for serving well with integrity. These were Adam Smith, uh, 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 corporate leaders, understanding that uh, our corporations work best uh, on, a, on a moral foundation. And we've lost a lot of this. We know the stories of Skilling and Fastow, of Enron, brightest and the best, but without core values. So my hat's off, by the way, to St. Thomas for continuing to teach these. So how do we address this issue of getting core values, uh, these core religious values, back on the table? You know, some years ago, 75% of the high school kids admitted that they cheat. Now it's up to 95%. These are our future bankers and politicians. Look at what happened at Harvard just recently. Over 200 students were caught uh, cheating. So the issue of core values, these core religious values, this is key. We can pass all the regulations, but core values that, that I grew up in with the, some of the people and many more. So somebody help me on this. How do we get this back on the table? <laughs> well, that was a narrow question. Which one of you wants to tackle that? <laughs> you want to start? <laughs> I, um, Go ahead. I'll, I'll start. I, you know, um, I, re I appreciate the question because I, 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 um, it's such an it's such an obvious need right now. And I, 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 my first response is to come at it from a corporate citizenship perspective for obvious reasons. I think that the role of corporate citizenship, of foundation giving, of um, of getting business leaders to think beyond themselves, to come together in a room, has an incredibly powerful role in the corporation. When you look at what Ken Powell and his leadership uh, team is doing, and the dialogue that he was talking about earlier today, the disagreement, the discussion, um, that is coming out of places like this. This is a leader um, uh, I haven't worked for, I've had the privilege of being around, uh, who understands it, who understands the role of the corporation in society, who understands his role as a leader within the team. Um, and these conversations are very different. At the Medtronic Foundation, um, I watched that happen over and over again. When we, we had our CEO on the board, but he didn't chair the board. Uh, we had other executives there. And it was uh, a really fun process to watch as we talked about, for example, strategic philanthropy. How are we gonna manage the ethics of this, folks? We're talking about uh, business good and societal good. And we literally came up with models that we use to stimulate conversation, to ask ourselves, where do you see us on this chart? Um, are, we too close, uh, are we too close to the no-go zone here? Um, and we had that up there almost every meeting. There's certainly every meeting that we had a, a real issue. And there was serious debate in the room and the CEO, not necessarily on those issues, uh, I don't think it was necessary, but on many issues was overruled by others on the, te on the team. He was outvoted, he didn't use his veto power. Um, but the very process of engaging a team and engaging executives, asking them to take time out on a quarterly basis to review the issues, to understand the greater global challenges uh, and have that conversation really does have a powerful role in the corporation from what I've seen. And it's not a cure-all, it's not a silver bullet, but there is a cultural change that happens when people are focused beyond the quarter uh, on the longer-term needs and they understand their role in society. So that's one, one thought. Yeah, I think that's good. I, I think um, there's, um, we were talking about change and what creates change and corporate change. And I, I, I think about some of the issues where we've seen change over the years. Um, civil rights and women's rights being a couple of them, um, usually it's been because of a combination of 
outside activist organizations who are very powerful and so very very clear civic engagement in, the, in community and the support of those activist organizations which um, has to come from someplace not necessarily a corporation because that's sometimes not in the um, purview of corporate giving but sometimes it is but certainly private philanthropy can support that as well um, and then people in advocates inside organizations who have viewpoints that they can express, um, I think are incredibly important. And that would be employees, um, employees as well as, as business partners. And, um, and I think the, um, one of the places where a lot of that discussion happens is in the foundation board meetings or in the corporate contributions meetings or in the volunteer activities where people are exposed to different perspectives than they otherwise would be exposed to, which I think is, is part of what builds the capacity to listen and to, um, to change. But um, I've also seen it, um, and I, I think some of the financial companies right now are, are um, I don't know, it's a different deal. They're not, it, it's almost like they're not selling a product. And I, um, they're, they're just dealing in money. There's something funny going on on that in that sector. I can say that about the insurance industry too, obviously. Um, it's part of that sector, but um, I've, I saw a huge change um, uh, happen when um, we stopped kind of thinking about the customer and whether we were providing great service to the customer and really just were thinking about multiples and how we were gonna get more money in the door because, um, because Wall Street was really forcing that. And um, I, think, I, think it's, I think some industries are more capable of doing some of those things than others, depending on what the product is and what the culture happens to be on Wall Street. Another question? Right here. Thank you. So this is uh, for, for either panel. And I think, Mary and David, you alluded th to this a little bit. Um, I'm wondering to what extent corporate social responsibility is a United States phenomenon as opposed to a global one, and how um, your response to that would inform any globalization, whether it's United States companies expanding overseas or other countries increasing their presence here in the United States. I think somebody talked about uh, the fact, it was Nate, and, and some of the speakers talked about the fact that we don't have international, well, we might have international laws, but they're not enforceable. Um, and I think that's a, an issue. And, and generally, what we found, we had a small international program for a while when St. Paul Companies was expanding to other parts of the world, uh, notably uh, Europe. And the Europeans thought we were nuts. And um, <laughs> And I ended up on a panel with somebody from Bank of America, the European Foundation Network, with somebody, not Bank of America, from Deutsche Bank, um, arguing what was corporate responsibility. Was it philanthropy or was it the way you did your business? And BP was there, you know, and I'm kind of, you know, now you kind of look at all those companies and you say, well, let's see, who, who's doing better here? I'm not sure. Um, but but they, their philanthropy was mostly focused on places that they had colonized. So, you know, you would find British companies giving in India and in the African countries where, that they had colonized previously, and, and that's where they thought charity should go. They didn't think it, it really belonged in Europe. On the other hand, in South Africa, one of the things we found was that the government of South Africa was made up of nonprofit executives. When apartheid um, was gone, um, when they had to form a government, the only leadership, where the, the place where leaders were trained was in the nonprofit sector. And so that, those are the people who ended up running the government and that, it, thank goodness. Now that left the nonprofit sector without leadership, but it, um, it was uh, a, a, a wonderful testament in a way to this notion that, um, that the nonprofit you know, it's like what a nonprofit is, is it's people who come together to do stuff that business won't do and government, business can't do and government can't do. And it's, it's that civic participation and the things you learn in civic participation that, that it makes that sector so rich, I think. And um, so uh, from the standpoint of corporate responsibility, I think there are some places on the earth that, it, from the standpoint of philanthropy, certainly know it better in some ways than we do because 
in some ways because they have less and they and so if you talk to Native American communities in this country for example philanthropy is a big long tradition for them and it's been going on forever they never called it that it just is what you did um, it's what we did in farm communities when we t looked after each other um, and um, and that was that's true in other parts of the world too but they don't, they don't organize it in that way um, I'll stop talking you probably <laughs> yeah, no it's good yeah, your, your question actually gets to one of the conversations uh, I had on the break earlier where it, it sounds like the next phase for somebody in the room is to look at how this unfolds globally. Um, mm -hmm. Man, I don't know how you're going to do that because it, the question, I mean, every country is so different in its approach. Um, I mean, the, the, for us, one of, the, one of the most enjoyable parts of doing this from a U.S. perspective was the volunteer side of things because not very many countries come anywhere close to what we do in terms of volunteering uh, in communities. And that was a, that was a learning for me uh, over the time that I was uh, at Medtronic and it was such a joy um, to be able to expand your, your, um, the reach of your programs and to be able to be engaging uh, employees in China and India and across Europe and to have the, the blue t-shirts and the branded t-shirts and to have photos coming into chairman's briefings of literally hundreds of people cleaning up rivers or doing whatever their community needed. Um, and the, the, the foundation giving is certainly at times um, very different than, than other countries um, because other countries have a safe, basic safety net or at mm -hmm. least did mm -hmm. have a basic safety net. So when it came time to you know, expanding for us into Europe, uh, the conversation was, well, what exactly would we do in that area? And certainly the executive, many of our executives were quick to point out that we actually are doing philanthropy in their mind through our ta increased taxes, right? On the other hand, that Europe's the place that gave us the push um, for our corporate social responsibility for our environmentalism right. uh, and whatnot. And thank goodness um, for that part of globalization, right? It gets to that question earlier in the day of not only what, what are you pushing, but what are you learning um, from other cultures? Um, so it's, it's, that's, it's a fun mm -hmm. part of the work. Well, somebody who's been involved in this work has been David Logan from um, London, and he's done a lot of work with corporations all over the world, and it was the European companies like Deutsche Bank that were doing social reports and most of us, I mean, we did, we did a couple in the 19, early 1980s. We did two social audits, never to be published, mind you, but <laughs> we did them. And, but to, to actually have them published and out, they've really done an amazing job with all that. I, I might add that uh, if, you're, if you go to places like Bo uh, Business for Social Responsibility or the Boston College Corporate Citizenship Conference, uh, BSR in particular has offices all over the world, mm -hmm. um, initiatives in, in, in uh, China. Uh, Brazil has its own organizations that work on corporate uh, responsibility and corporate social responsibility and ethics. So there's a, a growing uh, network of, of organizations around the world that pay attention to this. And uh, certainly, uh, if you look 10 years ago, there were these arguments about, well, is Europe ahead or is US ahead? And, and uh, I think uh, both are paying a lot more attention to a broader sense of this than they, they perhaps were. Is there another question? Well, I, Ken is reminding <laughs> me, uh, <clears throat> um, thanks to our grant from Hall Halloran, Hall Halloran Philanthropies, uh, I must be getting tired. I've been up since 5.30 this morning. No. So um, We uh, have conceived of this as two phases. Uh, phase one is the U.S. experience, uh, and uh, certainly that was bigger and more challenging than we anticipated. Phase two is, is really taking a look at the global experience and trying to get our arms around uh, how that has evolved. Uh, perhaps not over 200 years, maybe we'll constrain that a little bit, but as we uh, get through uh, this uh, chapter in our work, we're going to be looking forward to doing uh, some additional work on this. But I think always with an eye on, you know, what What's coming up down the road? I think one of the most interesting things here is how, and Archie touched on this, and David's touched on this, um, how this has been changing uh, over the decades. So we're looking forward to that. We have a question up here. Okay. So th I look forward to reading the book. It's going to be very informative to help me understand the past, so then I can use that information to inform leaders within my company to what the future can be. So it's really great. 
What I would love to hear from, from the panel is maybe just a thought on what you see kind of, because again, everything in history is cyclical. What has happened in the past will eventually happen in the future. We just hope we can stay in front of it and not make the same mistakes or learn from those. Where do you see as the biggest kind of threats and maybe the, the greatest opportunities um, in regards to corporate responsibility companies doing it or not doing it? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think I've already alluded uh, to it, so you know, sorry to hit on the, the same theme here, but I, it, those of us who have led in this shared value or this value creation space, um, there are a lot of different terms for it, um, are really excited about what it can do. Um, when it comes out of corporations, when it comes out of leadership, and when it comes out of boards who get it, right? Who get what it looks like to be in authentic engagement with communities. Um, and are explicit about what their intentions are. Um, but I think the, the turn on the road here uh, to negotiate is ensuring that corporations get it and that there is a profession there that's established, that there are operating systems that people can understand. One of the, one of the recommendations that comes out of this report, it really comes out of the fact that there's no common language here for describing what it is that we do in corporate citizenship functions. I mean, we spent, you know, probably the first two months, you know, starting meetings with different language and people would say, stop, are you talking about this? And finally we said, hey, here's, you know, we're doing an abbreviation here, we gotta go loose. Um, but we have to figure out how to have this dialogue in the company um, in a way that makes sense and hangs together for our executives who increasingly have less and less time. We have to be able to have the conversation that talks about where the appropriate lines are, why we're doing it, ensures that the engagement is authentic and not cynical engagement. Um, and I'm very encouraged that the council has taken this up and, um, and is running with it. And um, I'd be remiss if I ended you know, my remarks today without acknowledging the fact that the Council, Minnesota Council on Foundation, Bill's organization, uh, on October 10th is partnering with the National Council on a workshop uh, to, that, to that end, right? To, to essentially take this report and put it into application to talk about how do we do this, how do we manage that well. And I fully expect that out of uh, the Minnesota experience, we will continue to be uh, a leading area. I can, I can tell you that when we rolled through here putting this report together, um, that this was the place where we had um, the most dynamic interaction, from, candidly the most sophisticated conversation about this and candid place and it's something to be very proud of. So a little longer than I wanted to be but hopefully, hopefully <laughs> on point. Uh, let's thank our, oh Mary do you have a comment? You know I do. Go for it. All right, it's, it's a little, um, I, I hope it's not too off point, but, but I wish I could think of something in terms of just corporate responsibility, but it's a broader issue that worries me, and it's, it's, um, it's the gap in income, and the um, gap between have and have nots in this country as well as globally, between the global north and the global south. I feel that a lot of the violence we see is, it comes out of that. It's just a fundamentally unfair world and it really disturbs me. And I think, I don't know if it's cynicism, I'd call it greed maybe. Um, I, and I, I say that quite honestly, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I think that, um, I think that you can't treat people like this forever without, without people getting angry and upset and, and um, not wanting to participate in the system and wanting to create their own. And I think, I think we see that in, um, I, think, I think Africa is, is gonna be a very interesting place in the next few um, years because um, there's, there, there's quite a bit of unrest, there's quite a bit of poverty. <laughs> And there's a lot of, um, of uh, what's the term, um, where you take money that isn't yours? Corruption, corruption thank you. <laughs> I'm getting old. Oh. <laughs> there's a lot of corruption. And, um, and people know it's there, and then there are these efforts to get rid of it, but it's still there. And American business is part of it. And it, it's bothersome. So do you see a paradigm, just to follow up, because I'm just trying to, again, I'm trying to understand from the past, so do you see a potentially a paradigm setting up where what we saw in the Gilded Age and the reaction of the progressives and how they began to really um, 
really react against the, the unfettered greed, some people called it 100 plus, 100 plus years ago. Do we see that similar paradigm beginning to establish and maybe corporate responsibility as a way to, like they didn't have 100 years ago, to begin to kind of shift and soften that and begin to change behaviors and, and not have the same overreaction by government regulating like they did in the, the teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s? I don't, I don't, I'm, some historian probably has to respond to that. <laughs> I think, uh, <laughs> at the reception. <laughs> well, I, I want to thank our panel. I thank David and Mary for being here. <laughs> you know, when I, when I started this, uh, I had no idea how big it was. I've mentioned that before. I was a history major, history and government. Uh, but what we studied was political history. Um, what I've realized in doing this book is, is really there's an intersection of social, economic, political, and uh, business history here that I really didn't pay any attention to when I was in school. And this has been a fascinating experience. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you one little vignette, which I hope you'll look for in the book that Kirsten found. Um, there's a picture of a sugar bowl, and it's from the 1840s, something like that, and on that sugar bowl is a, an, Im an image of a slave. And they, these groups that were anti-slavery used that sugar bowl to sell free sugar. This was social advocacy. This was the voice of the, if you will, the NGOs back in the 1840s standing up for ideals and they were protesting against what, if you will, businesses, slaveholders, were doing uh, in the South. Uh, and you see these little examples that we today think of as these sophisticated NGOs like uh, the Sierra Club or whatever, uh, but th they're evident as you go back all the way through this history. So we had this conversation about is this, is this push, the advocacy world, the hammer, which you might say, or is it pull, visionary leaders? It's really both. And I think our, our panel here is, has tried to suggest that, uh, that there's a lot to be learned from this history. And I'll, I'll uh, encourage you to go outside and look at the books and, and take an opportunity to take it home with you. I do want to thank all of our panelists today.